All right. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. The Wayne in Spain falls mainly on the plains. The aunts in France stay mainly in your bonds. All right. Hey, happy Monday. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results, but please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. Hi, my name is Wayne. I chief all day, and I strategize all night. Therefore, I'm the chief FX market strategist for TradersWay.com. I'm here to help you. I need you to ask questions, get involved, so that I can help. Looking at uh, Andrew says, I hear music. Uh, I turned it off, bro. Let me just triple check it for you. You shouldn't hear it anymore. Do these sessions 7.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday here at Forex. Start today, except this Friday is the first Friday of May. And I will be hosting uh, Trade Non-Farm Payrolls Live 145, I think it is. 145 months of doing that webinar. So I'll see you over there on Friday. Otherwise, I'll be at Forex.today on Monday. I'll be at Forex.today on Tuesday. I'll be at Forex.today on Wednesday. I'll be at Forex.today on Thursday. If you're uh, enjoying these webinars, maybe even seeing an improvement in your trading, um, just simply out of loyalty and respect, would you please visit tradersway.com and open up an account? How long have I been at Trader's Way now? Three years? I'm not very good with time, Emilio. I'll give you an example. Um, I was awake and working at 1.30 in the morning. And, uh, well, <laughs> my day yesterday was, you know, I don't know, 19 hours long. So days and years get all gobbledygook. All right. I usually know what day of the week it is by what news release happened today. So, yeah. And is it... And am I trading Sunday night or am I trading Monday morning? What's the difference? It's, it's Monday morning somewhere. So anyways, how long? Yeah, three years. I don't think it's been four. I'm pretty sure it's been three. So three and a half. Yeah, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do stuff like that. Oh, oil inventories came out. It must be Wednesday. Yeah. Or CPI came out, so it must be pretty close to the 15th. You know, like that kind of stuff. Anyways. Um, let me fire up my charts. Let's get good. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. You look good. I can. You didn't know that? There's a reverse mirror. You can see my webcam, but I can lose. Yeah. I can see into your soul, Freddy boy. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, let me move that out of the way. Uh, 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 beginning of the week, pretty close to the beginning of the month. Why don't we start with the calendar, as they say in Europe. Let's just get rid of me mids. Okay. So the big news this week, RBA statement, Kiwi jobs. So tomorrow's going to be a great Asian session. European GDP. Yeah, why not? You think that's going to overpower the Fed's interest rate decision? Mm, probably not. 
But both these things should affect the euro dollar, don't you think? <clears throat> now, we've had reasonable dollar strength over the last month. Here's my thoughts on that. I have a feeling either this meeting or the next meeting, which is probably what, late June? I think this meeting or the June meeting, because after June it's September, right? Early September, and then the next one is late October. Um, I think they need to start telling us that they're closer to rate to the end of the rate cycle. So put it this way: they raise interest rates because uh, they want to influence inflation. Well, what is inflation? right what is growth they don't want too much growth they don't want too much inflation and all that kind of stuff and when you put it together it's not a lot it's some but it's not a lot and all they're doing is moving interest rates basically from zero to some normal level but the normal level isn't very high so I have a I have a itching feeling, like a hair growing on a mole, that we're closer to the end of that cycle, just because there's not a lot of growth, there's not a lot of inflation, so we don't need very high interest rates, at least on the shorter term, right? So if they start to say stuff like that then the world's going to find out, well, maybe they're holding too many dollars, maybe they were too aggressive and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but Shaw, what, what if they, I don't know. So what if growth is, what if growth is uh, 3%, but inflation is 1.5%? What should interest rates be? More than one and a half percent? Right? You might find you might find that real growth, the real growth of the economy might only be one per one and a half percent. Why would you need three percent interest rates? So that that's just my thought process on that. Like, wow, at some point we're probably closer to normal, right? Now, maybe the Fed is thinking beyond normal, and they're thinking, wow, the world is just booming, right? Uh, well, we don't quite see that yet in macroeconomics, right? We, we see some. Uh, I, I, would, I don't think I'd be aggressive yet. But the, you know, the, one, the one thing I think that you should watch are oil prices. Maybe we scrap the whole thing that you're taught in school, scrap growth, scrap inflation, right? You don't need to look at GDP and real GDP, inflation, real inflation, and all this kind of stuff. What if we just throw out the whole playbook and just say, if oil goes up, interest rates go up? We'll use that as a yardstick for global macroeconomics. Barry says, do you see oil going up though? Well, we saw it go from, we, you know, we predicted it would go from 40 to 55 and then back to 50 and then from 50 to 60. And then we predicted it would go from 60 to 70. How about gold, Matt? Yeah, that's the dollar, right? That's the dollar play. So anyways, uh, 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 let's just uh, finish this. European CPI, obviously, that's going to be important. And then we go from uh, interest rate to I guess they're going to talk about their monetary policy two days after their interest rate hike. 
<laughs> a little late, man. So anyways, the RBA wants to talk again. So they're calling a meeting on Thursday. And then non-farm payrolls here in, in America. And then over the weekend, uh, Bank of Japan releasing their uh, meeting minutes. See if I miss anything here. Oh yeah, don't forget Polish BMI. It's going to move the Zlaty. ISM manufacturing. I'm looking for ISM services. Oh, yeah, that's non manufacturing. So we have ISM on Thursday. That's great. Kiwi inflation expectations. Okay, that's going to be an important one. Uh, and then the CAD news after uh, NFP. That's cool. Cool. That's, that's going to be a good Friday. Cool. So that's a pretty nice week, right? Spread out. Obviously, uh, non-farm payrolls is the big one. Uh, uh, interest rates in the United States, another big one. And then we got a couple of Asian sessions, fine. And then, you know, European CPI, European GDP. Do we care about those things? I guess Europeans do. Um, so I guess we'll have to pay attention. Um, Overall, I think it's, you know, again, it's a good week for greasing the skids. Um, I think the big trend movers will will really come down to um, not the jobs report, but I think what the Fed says. So I think really uh, it's going to Wednesday, I think it's going to be the big day, not even Friday. So somebody, uh, somebody said, hey, what about oil? What about gold? I don't know. You want to take a look at them? Yeah, let's look at oil. Let's look at gold. What is all of this? Well, I have it coming down to about 67. And then we're looking for a bottom. Okay. Let me use a drawing tool to illustrate that so i'm trying to connect ah, come on drawing tool try to connect that bottom with this future bottom okay now that hasn't happened yet so it's just a guess right but remember our previous guess was this might be a top remember that whole guess Looks like it was a top. Notice how it just fell back to support. Okay, cool. Then we're in this kind of mode here. And now we're at the moment of truth where we're lining up sort of this support and this downtrend. We don't really know what's going to happen, but you'd think even on the short term, even if it was going to stay in the downtrend, that they would still give you an up, wouldn't it? It'd still get you back to the central pivot and then down. Okay. If you're a bear on oil, you can see when the market opened, you had an opportunity to sell. This is an aggressive entry sell. Okay. But if you were bear, that's a pretty easy open for you. You're just gonna, gonna sit on it now. Okay. I think you're actually fairly comfortable on this as a bear because you if you were a bull. You should have bought it in here, right? Really, ideally, right? It's 
So yeah, so I think a bear is pretty confident right now. You got it at 6840, huh? 68. So you shorted this last week. Uh, 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 okay. Well, this is an easy uh, re-entry for you as a bear. You're talking about selling it up in here. Okay, that's fine too. It's all good. But as far as the weekly swing, this is a sell zone. This was the buy zone. You can see it's sort of like a, a double buy zone. But bulls didn't buy it. And that, that's the whole concern. So the next technical bottom is going to be like this area. Okay. And then the next buy zone is obviously down in here. I'm just putting this further out. I think I'd like to buy it around 65 if it comes down to 65. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, 50, sorry, not 50, uh, 5, 65. So last week or the week before, I think it was last week, we, we had this line. You guys remember that? So it's really 66. We're at 67 and a half. Yeah, if it came down to 66, I think I would start uh, itching to buy it again. Oh, 61. So you just say just right in here. You're getting out just before the tart. Yeah, okay. That's pretty aggressive. Um, but yeah. I can see that. So your your bigger play is this one. This is your your expected top for the month. And this is your expected bottom for the month. Yeah, I get that. Hello, my name is Wayne McDonald and I approve this message. Yeah, I see what you're doing. That's totally fine. Set up on last month's pivots. Totally. Now that that's gonna mean uh, dollar strength, it's going to mean um, some sort of core macroeconomic uh, uh, news or geopolitical risk. So I don't really want that, but I, you know, obviously it could happen. I'm just trying to think what it might be. Uh, I guess you know what's going to lead to that is the opposite of what I was talking about earlier, and that would be a Fed that um, is talking about you know interest rates going to the moon. But have you noticed that the ten-year T note? It's below three, but it's just barely below three. It doesn't seem like foreigners have been piling into it. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know. That's the that's the thing I, I, I've been saying that you should keep your eye on, right? What is it now? Two point nine six point or two point nine six five four or something? Um, it didn't drop to two point seven five or two point eight, right? Went from three point oh to two point nine six and a half. So it doesn't really matter what the interest rate is. Remember, it's all relative, right? What matters is whether foreigners buy it. Okay. So yeah, we really need to pay attention to what the Fed says this particular week. 2.9560. Didn't I say 2.95? Pretty close to that, whatever I said. All right, cool. Thank you, Ben. Okay. But remember, a week ago when, when we first got to near 3.0, I said, if it drops all the way back to like 2.8, we know foreigners locked in the high interest rate. And therefore, the dollar should get ripper strong. Well, the dollar is strong, but it doesn't seem like foreigners are buying the U.S. dollar to buy treasuries because then the treasury yield would have moved, right? So the dollar is strong, but something else may be happening. 
And we know some of the other central banks are talking their currencies down. So maybe at one point, it's, uh, it's the U.S.'s turn and the dollar weakens, right? Maybe they all take turns. So anyway, the interest rate decision on Wednesday and uh, is, I think is going to be more important towards that topic than um, NFP on Friday. Okay. So, right? Read it. Take it as an opportunity to try to figure out what's happening. All right, cool. All right, going back to euro dollar, you can see we've already identified support. Let me put it on an hourly chart, right? I think we did pretty good on nailing that. And the thought here is, well, a bull's going to want to buy it. Maybe you get a double bottom. See how I've drawn the double bottom? Let me move this over now. This is sort of like a cautionary tale. If you're gonna if you're gonna trade this, look for the double bottom first. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think you can see that there's a lot of bearishness in here. So if you're going to trade a bullish move in a bear in bearish market conditions, you should at least expect a reversal pattern, right? Right? If market conditions are bearish and you're bullish, you should at least expect a reversal pattern. You shouldn't be buying something unless it's reversed. Okay, that's the fir first thought process. And so we drew this last week. Can you see it came up a little more? It came down. Now, what if you're a bear? What is what is a good selling opportunity in a bearish market using technical analysis? What do you look for to sell in a bearish market? Higher, low, okay, great. Roll reversal. All right, you ready for this? On three, two, one. The 21 EMA. 21 EMA is a dynamic level of resistance. And you should sell. Oh, West, 152, thank you. Now you say, well, the 21 is not touching price. It will be. So remember, the 21 EMA is also lagging. So you kind of want to sell just before you hit it. It's like shooting in front of a running deer. Right. 
<clears throat> it's like trying to hit a moving target because it quite literally is moving. So you need to look at the 21 as a selling in a downturn, a selling opportunity or a buying opportunity on a, in a bullish market. So this up, 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 and then sell. Okay. This is the uh, hourly chart. And you, you can see the combination, the 2155 is your sell zone. The reason I do that is the 50, if you do the math, right the 55 and the 21 they have a relationship with each other so that it makes a lot of sense that this 55 ends up being a lot like that 21. Okay. so again it's very bearish Maybe at the London Open, you could have sold it. I mean, think about it, right? You could have sold it at the London Open in a bearish market. It's not that complicated, right? You have to be a rocket surgeon to, to sell a 50% retracement. You do have to be a rocket surgeon. <laughs> Chad says you do have to be a rocket surgeon. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that was clearly there. If you wanted to sell in a downtrend at the London Open. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. Yes, you could have. No, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon. Yeah. Okay. But if you're a bull, then you should at least wait for some sort of confirmation that the market is bullish. Now, you can buy a double bottom. So now you can drop to this 15 minute chart or even a five minute chart, take a shot. Your stop is still going to just be below that. So you can take a shot. If you're going to trade the double bottom, trade it at the double bottom because then your stop is the closest. Yeah, it's risky, but you're not risking as much. Like some people, what they do is they wait for it to be way up here, and then they're like, now I'm going to trade the double bottom. Well, yeah, but you just sold it, or sorry, you just bought it in a sell zone because you know a bear is going to do this. So they're going to wait for up here and then drop it. And now you're like, well, I'm a cautious bull, so you buy it right in their sell zone. Uh, no, if, you're going to, if you've made the decision in advance to trade the double bottom, then trade the damn double bottom. Trade it at the double bottom. Trade it at the double bottom. So if you're wrong and it drops, well, then you lose a little bit of money. You took a shot. But at least now you're trading double bottoms. Okay? Just don't wait 40 pips out of position to, to buy. If you're going to buy it there, then buy it. Um, the more conservative way of trading this is double bottom, higher, high, higher, high, low, one, two, three, roll over type stuff. Okay? Emilio says, if, in that case, if you're going to trade it, well, first of all, I don't know if you're scalping or swing trading, okay? But would would you agree that it should at least be lower than this? So Emilio, it's got to be lower than the lowest low. Then you might find that, you know, if you're if you're trading way up here, you're going for hundreds of pips, and you might only be risking 33. Okay. 
So you're like, I'm risking 33, but I'm going for 233. Okay, that'd be good. But if you find you're risking 33 and you're only going for 50, well, then you're in a downtrend buying and hoping for slightly more than you're risking. And that's just not likely to happen in a downtrend. So also the validity of your trade plan, like, I might have a different stop if I say, look, I'm buying this monthly pivot. I think it's going to go up here. So it's more than a double bottom. It's a double bottom on May's pivot. And I'm going to rally it up for hundreds of pips. I expect to be in this for weeks, not hours. Well, then I might, have, I might give myself more stop, right? But John's like, yeah, don't buy in a downtrend, sell it. Well, maybe your definition for this is not downtrend, it's uptrend, okay? So could you buy this? So this line is where we are now price-wise. Could you buy that? Hell yeah. So it just depends what your trade plan is, right? So I agree with John, don't buying a downtrend, but I could just, I could pop this chart up and say, well, it's not a downtrend, it's an uptrend. Um, so it, it's whatever your strategy is, right? John is right. Um, but I might have a strategy that looks like this, and I, I'm not necessarily wrong. John might have a, something that is looking at this, and he's not wrong either. So again, if you happen to want to be buying, Right, I I actually wrote this trade plan last week, saying if you wanted to buy it based on a longer term uh, uh, support, then you would want a double bottom higher high, at the very least, right? And then a double and then a uh, one two three would be the next one, and now you're buying dips. Well, the double bottom is your first dip. The one two three is going to be the second dip, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so here's the thing. Every time you buy, there's a seller that thinks the opposite of you. Every time you sell, there's a buyer on the opposite side of that trade that thinks you're wrong. So there's always going to be someone else on the trade. And it's partially because of what I just showed you. Right? What time frame are, are you on? And they're not always the same. All we know is price. For the conservative entry, what time frame are you looking for? Higher, higher? Again, Manny, you're asking me like, uh, I don't know, how, how do you drive a race car? Or how do you drive? How do, how do you drive on a racetrack? Well, are you driving 270 miles an hour, or are you driving your Ford Taurus? <laughs> At the Atlanta Motor Speedway, they have a, a turn that is no joke, like this. And if you're not over, what were they saying? If you're not over 130 miles an hour, the car actually rolls. It'll roll down the hill. It's so steep. Um, uh, it's probably a terrible analogy. I'm just saying it all depends, Manny. For a conservative entry, what time frame are you looking for the higher, high, high? Well, the, the longer you want to be in the trade, and that's the key, the longer you want to be on the trade. Sometimes I want to be in the trade for four months, Manny. So if you want to be in the trade for four hours, my, my answer would be different, right? So for the conservative entry, if I'm looking for a higher, high, high, low role reversal, it depends. So on a, if, you're, if you're going to be in the trade for a few hours, 
a spot a, a 15 minute chart's more than enough right if you want to make this a day trade like you're in it for the whole day not just see a, a, a couple of hours you know let's say between two and four hours that's the london open and then another two to four hours the new york open london close session but if you're looking at a one hour chart gee whiz that could that could be a whole day day and a half two days right So you have to ask yourself if you're, you know, I guess it's not even ask yourself, analyze, right? If you're looking at a double bottom, higher, high, higher, low, how long did it take to form that on a one hour chart? It could literally be a day and a half, 36 candles, right? So if you get it right and it's now trending up, you'll probably be in the trade longer than 36 hours. You see where I'm getting at? Or if you're looking at a 15 minute chart and, it, and it's a downtrend, but it double bottoms, then makes a higher high, then makes a higher low, how long did that take? Maybe add 50% on top of that time wise. Yeah, right? So I might be looking at bottoms that that occurred between January, well, actually it wouldn't be January, let's say sort of the end of February, early March period, and at the uh, end of July, I might be looking at, at that as a triple bottom and say, well, if I can pick it up here, I'm gonna be in it for four months, maybe, maybe longer, okay? So that's the fractal nature of the charts, and you need to use the charts um, and say wisely you have to align your expectations with the chart okay cool a lot of my trades are time based they're not price based because i'm i'm pricing i'm timing central banking announcements right i'm trying to time uh interest rate decisions and the fed meetings i'm trying to to, uh, time seasonality okay so for example what is the what will the price of the euro dollar be on December 31st what will the euro dollar be priced at Type in a question mark if you have no idea. And Emilio and John say 109 or 111. I mean precise. I want the precise number. So the pip. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'm huge question mark. I have no idea. But I know what I'll be doing, whether I'm a bull or a bear. Cool, right? What will the pound yen be priced? What what will the price be for the pound yen on December thirty first? I I don't know that I don't know that either, but I'm I'll know if I'm I know now if I'm going to be a bull or a bear. Okay, so I'll be selling it, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be a bear. So, like, but see that at that point, I use technical analysis to identify whether it's a good price to sell or not a good price to sell. My point is, it's time-based macroeconomics and not technical. Okay, but that's pretty far out, right? That's like, that's literally far out, far out. Okay. Aussie, Aussie, there's your cell zone. 
And if you're a bull, you're looking to buy it now. You know how I know? Because last week I told you so. Okay. So if you are a bull, you think you're looking for something like that. Is that unreasonable to expect? We have three no's. Okay, so it's not unreasonable to expect. If we got a move like that, is it going to freak all the bears out and they, they run away screaming in fear? John bad attitude. <laughs> John <B. A. laughs> Define unreasonable. You define unreasonable. You're the audience, John. You define it. <laughs> See, I think it's actually fairly expected. You see that? I don't think it would change a thing. Okay? Because what's what will the bears do in that, at that price? In fact, if I was a bear, I would actually be hoping on my... So what do I say? Be Wayne now. WWWD. What would Wayne do? If I was a bear on this, and the charts open like this, like May opens like this, I'd say, oh, it's oversold. We're out of position. Right? And, and I, I would get all weird about it. I get weirded out. I'm like, oh, it's bearish, and I am a bear, and I get why it's falling, but it's, it's, it's out of position. I actually want it to rise. Because I sell rallies as a bear, Do, right? Think about how many people were buying real estate that was way overvalued, hoping it would, it would go even higher overvalued. It becomes a risky game at some point, right? Now, I'm actually one of the rare people on this planet that when I realized Trump was likely to win or had a reasonable shot of winning the presidency, I read his book. And I've met so many people that just absolutely hate Trump. Hate him like, like you're like a freaky, radical, hippie, radical, hippie, freaky person, right? Like they're so angry. I'm like, get in your Tesla and Go somewhere else, right? And I'm talking about all my friends. Um, they just hate Trump. And then I'll say, well, have you read his book? Do you know anything about him? And inevitably, the answer is no. I'm like, well, I didn't know anything about Trump. Yeah, he's arrogant. Of course, he has weird hair. But besides that, so, so I read his book. What the heck was I talking about, though, right? Uh, oh. Yeah, um, the number one rule in real estate is location, 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 right? And he said, that's stupid. That's not true. That's not true at all. Number one thing is price. Okay? So if I'm going to hate somebody, I better know something about them. It's a great book, by the way. Don't read the, the, the second half. Just read the first half. It's fantastic. And here's what the book is. It's called The Art of the Deal. And it just goes through his, his calendar, his daily agenda. It starts out like this. You know, December 31st, 1983 or whatever, right? And uh, on the calendar today, I'm talking to this person, talking to this person. Then my phone rang and that. And I didn't eat lunch this day because I don't eat lunch. It's a waste of time. 
And then, you know, this happened and that happened, and then I did this and then I did that. And you just go through his agenda. This was pitched to me, didn't like that. Then I saw this, needed to do that, needed to do that, you know. Um, called the mayor's office, they hate me, so I had to go down and do this. And this other thing happened, I was looking at this. But but very, it starts when he's like 20, and he's just a kid walking the streets of New York, right? So anyways, it's actually quite good. But my point here with this is the number one rule in real estate is not location, 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 it's price. Um, same sort of thing like perhaps the number one thing in um, – selling all the Aussie dollar isn't always just selling it. It's really at what price are you selling? Thank you, Brooke. So I would like to sell this somewhere between 76.28 and 76.76. So let's just say somewhere near 76.50. We're kind of out of position. So it's bearish and I'm a bear. But it's sort of like, I like the house, I like the neighborhood, but it's $100,000 over what I would like to pay for it. So I wait. You see what I mean? I don't have to buy it at that price. And it's not a good at that price. I don't think I can make money at that price. How about that? I don't think I, if I sold that, I'm not convinced I'm going to make money. I need a better deal. I need a better offer. Okay? Now, the second thing is if it does continue to fall, I would expect it to hit this area first, or, or quickly, and then you should expect a move like this over the course of the remaining month. So if I'm a bear, I don't really want that. What I want is a slow and steady trend, okay? But imagine if everyone's bearish and everybody sold here and everybody sold here and everybody sold here. Uh, if, they, if, if you look at the velocity of how far it moved, so this one only moved this far, this one only moved this far, this is like twice as far in the same period. So these people that are short took, right? And these people that are short, well now they've made twice as much money in the normal amount of time. They're going to panic. Right? They're going to panic. They're going to take profit. And that's why you get the counter move. And that's why it's a counter trend trade. Right? And that's why I put in the book that professional traders, they don't lose sleep at night because they're losing money. They lose sleep at night because they're making money. They're worried about making money. When do I get out? When do I get out? When I get out? And if they're freaking out and losing sleep over that and they're asking themselves, when do I get out? Hitting the S2 on a monthly basis, more than enough permission to get out. And they're like, oh, thank goodness I have a reason. Out. Yeah, James, I must have been right around as the IPO as well. All right, so enough said. Uh, how about peso? We're getting pretty close.
Okay. Tomorrow's the first. You got permission now, right? You have permission to sell it if you want. Right now you have basically the double top, basically a lower low. You could do it if you wanted. Brooks so funny. So Brooks like bears are here, but they're not confident. Or you're not confident. Okay. Well, put it this way: it's not a confidence. There's no decision here. If you make money on this, what actually happens? Remember, it's a fundamental move. You think there's really a hedge fund manager talking with his portfolio managers? Hey, so what do you guys think? Should we corner the market on peso? What's actually going on? To make this drop. And unfortunately, the US dollar is strong right now, so it might screw this up. But what, what's the actual mechanism of what we're expecting? And if you don't know, type in a question mark, please. Yes, Mexican repatriation flows. This is a Mexican worker or resident or, or even citizen living in the United States and payday is happening. Today is the last day of the month. They're getting paid. Some people might get paid on the 31st. Some people might get paid on the 1st. They got some pay. Now, I explained last week that maybe some people got paid on the last Friday because, you know, if you wait to the first Friday of the month, that's non-farm payrolls. Like, that's on the 5th. So maybe you got paid on the last, you know, Friday. You know, you basically whatever. You know, so it's near the end of the month. That's why a lot of the, this move might have happened early. We also explained that there was an overlap between the, the um the, the monthly and the weekly pivots last week, and this predicted um, shoulder off of the uh, M3. So I told you in here, you had, you could think of it. You could, you could do it if you wanted to. It's early. You know it's early, but you can manage the risk. It has dropped. It has moved. But ultimately, this comes down to when does someone in the United States get paid? And precisely what day do they send some of that paycheck back to Mexico? To mom and dad or to the wife and kids, that kind of thing. The Mickey is correct. I don't think it's 2.8. I think it's 2.3, 2.4. might be almost 2.5. 2.8 sounds a little high, but I might be wrong. Okay. Okay, but that's the flow. So once again, that does not dictate anything about price, right? On June 1st, what is the price going to be for the USD Mexican peso? I don't know. I have no idea. What am I going to look to do at the beginning of next month, June? What am I going to look to do in June? So. Was I right on the 2.3? Nice. Cool. Yeah, so see, time-based stuff, guys. Really interesting, right? So if you were going to sell this, I would sell it here or I'd sell it there. There are my two plans, right? So let, let's do it this way. If I were going to sell this, I'm going to sell this move here. Okay. Plan B is I would sell that. Did you know there's no plan C? There's no buy. There's nothing you could do to make me buy this. And there's no plan C.
And if you don't mind me adding, it has to happen between now and the end of the week, preferably way sooner than that. Okay. Like if it's Thursday, I don't think I'm going to feel that comfortable. I mean, we got the non farm payrolls thing. That's just Friday seems too far off. So it kind of has to be, uh, you know, today, today, tomorrow. I mean, that's a judgment call. Okay. Okay. So what are you going to do? What you going to do? What you going to do? She got a pocket full of pips and my homeboys do too. Gold. Somebody asked about gold. Look at that. Ugly. Ugly. Well, it doesn't look up at the moment, does it? But I can't sell it. Uh, you're actually in a buy zone for whoever was gold. See you, RJ. You see this? To me, this whole area is a buy. Now, on a smaller time frame, I'm not right. I have the the opportunity to set up like a reversal pattern and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you wouldn't find me selling here. Uh, if you are a swing trader, uh, you had a very easy sell on the open. You never had a buy. Right? If you were bear and you swing trade, that is straightforward. There's no doubt that that's a sell. But there's not there's nothing else. And there was no buy. I don't I don't see a buy at all. Not not at all. So now you're at support and you cannot sell this for fear of being a fool. So um, so maybe, maybe, maybe you treat it as a quadruple something bottom uh, and you look at next, you look at a May monthly pivot in there, you kind of throw in this week's uh, weekly pivots so you can see down in here there's something going on. You know, wick, 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 wick. Um, so you couldn't catch me selling near this 1300 level, but maybe you could buy it and hope for the best. At least you're buying, you know, I think you would target the top of this range. Right? Right? And I think at some point on the longer run, this could try to go back up. Okay. And remember, I'm being influenced by a belief in improving macroeconomics. Right? Can you see what we were doing last week? Let's drop into the smaller time frame, a 15 minute chart. And uh, I'm going to have to turn that off. How'd I do on this one, setting this one up for you guys? 
Beautiful, right? Down, 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 up, up, sell. I have it going down to the pivot, and after that, I don't really know. And it went a little farther. And that'd be that. Remember, to get that move, we needed oil to go up. Remember that? We looked at oil first, and we looked at this. And we saw multiple reasons why a, a bull should take profit. So I said, well, you could set this up as a bear. And we set it up as a double top. Uh, I think pretty near a psych level. I think 129. Right? Remember all that? Remember, I'm a bear on the U.S. dollar. I'm a bull on Canadian dollar based on maybe oil prices staying elevated. All that kind of stuff. It was put together, and then and then look, basically all of Friday, it dropped. Cool. And then it opened at a bullish buy zone. And what tends to happen at a bullish buy zone? Even if the market is bearish, what tends to happen at a bullish buy zone? Even in a bearish market, what tends to happen at a bullish buy zone? Bulls buy, and presumably some bears should take profit, right? If you are now a bear, then I would be ready right here, right now, for a drop. For this to work, you're going to need oil prices to go up and the U.S. dollar to fall. But that's what I would be planning if I were me and if me were a bear. Yeah, right, John. Yeah. There is no way that red candle is a coincidence. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you're going to make money. I'm just saying you should know your price for which you enter. You should know your bias, and your job now is simply to identify the prices. If you... Open your chart looking for a trade you've already lost. I've said that a thousand times. And one day you might believe me. I'd rather you look at ec global economic conditions and decide the huge decision of whether things are getting better or things are not getting better. And from there, you can build assumptions and models that are hypotheses and predictions. And you could say, well, things are getting better, so therefore this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. Therefore, uh, commodity currencies, I might be bullish. So well, I'll look at those commodity currencies and say, oh, the charts are not very bullish, though. And then you just simply wait. Because now, if you wait for the conditions to turn bullish, and now you trade, and then you don't trade when they're not bullish, what is likely to happen? Well, you may have long periods of time where you don't trade, and long periods of time where you make a lot of money. Is that acceptable to you? Takes discipline. Yeah, John's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's harder than you'd think, right? But this is why, like, the portfolio manager project is so important. It gives you the focus of you either sell here or you don't sell. 
And you may go long periods of time without trading. But then you're also supposed to go long periods of time making money. So if you're a bear and, the, and this forms a, 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 a you know lower highs and lower lows, you should be making money. If you're still not making money, then there, there are problems that need to be fixed, right? So I'm thinking maybe that the um, the portfolio manager gig, I think maybe we should almost go to like a, a daily get together on that group and just keep everyone focused. Oh, every day, I'm not sure. Oh. Excuse me, sorry, I've only slept like three and a half, four hours. How do I look? Do I look all right? Yeah, not right. I have a problem. <laughs> right. Well, Danner, I'm talking about, you know, people that are supposed to be um, professional traders or want to be professional traders, right? So the major assumption is you, you can make money. And I think someone that is at least a break-even trader, I think if they are simply forced to not make decisions except for the right price, like if you're not allowed to decide like, hmm, am I bullish today or bearish today? I think that's holding most people back. I think if you know some technical analysis, you've been hanging around my webinars for a year or two or three or four, you should be good enough, right? You should be good enough to at least be modestly profitable, right? But yet many are not. In fact, I'd say most are not. And I think it comes from that the simple thing of should I buy today or should I sell today? There's your problem. That's it. We just identified it. You don't know what the hell you're doing. You're really, really, really good. Right? You're really, really good, but you have no strategy. Right? You're a highly trained elite forces, but you find yourself in the middle of Baghdad standing next to your Humvee directing traffic. And you're high and your special forces. So what we need to provide is the strategy. To me, you're only allowed to sell USD cat. And you'll say, oh, well, in that case, I'm interested at this price or I'm interested uh, at that price. Good. So when are you going to pull the trigger on this one? Well, I like it at this price. I like the roll reversal. It should flip over here. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll drop into a 15-minute chart and wait for some some divergence with the Stokes, and then maybe I'll take uh, I'll take a 21.55 cross on the on the five-minute chart, or maybe I'll on the five-minute chart I'll do a lower high um, or something or whatever. Now you have this technical plan, all centered around a price. But you're not saying, I wonder, what, uh, I wonder what's going to happen today. I wonder if I should be a buyer. Oh, look, I should buy this. Why not? Up, 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 down, down, buy. Up, 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 down, down, buy. Up, 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 down, down, buy, right? Not necessarily. That's what happened the last four hours. What happened the last four hours might not be valid anymore. So, Barry, I've run out of time. Why don't we regroup tomorrow? It's pretty late. It's uh, Why don't we regroup tomorrow and do all those trades? I mean, there's still a lot to cover. But um, – what do you guys think if I ran the portfolio manager group daily, where we get together every single day, and more like just hang out and look and and look at the charts together and listen to music and stuff? Because you know, as a portfolio manager, you might only be buying or selling two or three or four times a week.
right? So even if you don't have like the 5K to fund the live account, maybe you can still afford to join the team, trade the demo account, and we wait until you have your 5K. And of course, when you put in 5K, um, we increase your, your trading account from 5000 to $25,000. But if you're not ready for that, at least you can practice on your demo and we assign you a currency pair and you can hang with us every day. You're just not trading real money yet. Okay. I prefer people trading real money, but maybe you need six months under your belt. Maybe you need to rob the liquor store or something. I don't know. Right on, John. Yeah, well, okay, so Emilio, uh, and Ben and such, let, let's just talk about it tomorrow, huh? We'll come up with an idea. So that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I think we should just hang out more. But uh, it's funny, time is my problem, right? Time is my problem. But if, if it got more people involved, uh, serious people that want to trade and uh, trade for a living, running a fund or working at a bank, you know, yeah, I think we can get together, right? Well, Barry said, what did uh, Barry, if I'm a USD bull, oil falls. Well, if oil falls, yeah, you would be selling CAD, yeah. Oil, if oil's falling, CAD's going to weaken. But why is oil falling? Is that poor macroeconomic data? Well, then yen would strengthen. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Emilio, we'll take care of that tomorrow. I think what I'll do is I'll just give you my template. If you have the indicator, but you don't have the uh, it set up correctly, then if I give you my MT4 template, then it'll just go boom. It'll pop in the proper... Uh, settings. So uh, let's talk about it tomorrow and I'll upload the file and we'll see if that works for you. Okay. Cool. So if anyone is interested in joining uh, uh, the portfolio fund manager program, email me Wayne at fxbootcamp.com. Well, thank you very much for being clients of Traders Way, guys. We Honestly, appreciate you. Um, I'm, I don't know what, anything about any other broker, but we care about you. Maybe that should just be the motto. Choose Trader's Way because you know we care about you and we want you to succeed. There's the sales pitch. <laughs> right there it is. There's the sales pitch. So, um, yeah. Swing on by Trader's Way and give us an opportunity to earn your loyalty and respect, huh? Ben, it's not many. It's not many. I don't, I don't want a million people. Just a handful right now. I think about 10 or 15 people emailed me and begged me to start the program, so I spent thousands of dollars setting it up, and then about five people out of the 15 joined. What are you going to do? Oh, I mean, and then I said, look, not only, not only, because at first I thought I was going to double your account, but now it's up 400%, not 100%. Yeah. Yeah, less is more, I, right? So whatever. I'm just, anything I need to do for you guys to succeed, I'm willing to consider and maybe even do. So, yeah, I think so too, Emilio. I think so too. Uh, what's in it for me on long term is if you guys can actually trade, uh, and I put together a team of, you know, a dozen or two dozen traders I trust. Oh my gosh, do you understand how crazy that would be? Um, how much awesomeness we can rain down from the sky? But that's a that's a model that I've been working on probably eight years and have tried various things. Um, 
right? And But I haven't tried the portfolio manager model where I say, Emilio, you can only buy this. That I've never done. In the past, I'm like, do whatever you want, you right? Trade anything you want, just please be profitable. And no one has really truly stepped up to do that consistently. So if I do it the other way around where I'm like, oh, a portfolio manager doesn't make decisions like that. If they're running the yen ultra short fund, then they're shorting yen. I mean, so now all you have to do is like, is this resistance? Should I short yen here or should I short yen there? Here I short, there I short, everywhere I short, short, right? But you're not waking up the morning like, what do I do today? I'm short all these yen pairs. Should I buy them back? You're like, you're, It's so much better to think of it that way. And, of course, now you're building a track record of success. And if you're only shorting and then covering your risk, your, your, your statistics are going to be better. Your volatility is going to be lower. Your, your, your entries are going to be more refined. So I'm like, oh, that's what people need. And plus, I actually want, as a fund manager, I want a product I can actually sell to a, a, a billionaire. So I can say, oh, you know what you need, ma madam? You need a yen ultra short fund. Luckily, I have one for you. Here it is. Right? So anyways, whatever. Um, yeah, so if you want to join... Email me, Wayne at fxbootcamp.com. Other than that, have a wonderful day. I'm sorry it went on long today. We had to cover the fundamentals and stuff. I'll be here tomorrow. And the next day is going to be uh, interest rate decision day. Um, and then Friday is non-farm payrolls. I'll be over at Epic Street. Uh, we have tomorrow night is going to be a good uh, uh, Aussie session um, for Aussie and Kiwi news. Uh, I think it's going to be a great week. So I'm also... All, already looking forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. So peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. And uh, throw your diamonds in the sky. See you tomorrow, guys. Cheers.